the Air Force program, but at the same time we were getting great science data. And a number of students here at the university uh, analyzed the data. I can remember Bill Shen, that might have been Explorer 7, Mel Weinstein, um, Fred House, of course, myself. And so here they were kind of uh, piggybacking a science experiment on your mission, which had its own special purposes in those right. days. There was a lot of red tape. And um, at one time during the Vietnam War, um, I can remember we had the only classified contract uh, at the University of Wisconsin. And that made us all a little nervous because of what was going on at the time. <laughs> Um, but it you know, had an unclassified component, too, that you, some of the students could work with the data. Uh, but processing the data was, just to begin, it, it was really a chore. Just getting the data to the ground, it would sometimes take years, literally, to, to publish the results. Yeah. Right. May I uh, speak? interject uh, something here and looking back on how Sumi was able to be this creative a person who could think outside the box, do things that ordinarily weren't done in meteorology. Uh, I want to go back even before the time of satellites and cover something where uh, I'm going to read uh, in a uh, insert on a paper having to do with measuring moisture in the, with electronic dew point indicator, but that was used to measure water vapor in the stratosphere. And it said, Mr. Sumi received his B.E. degree in 1938 from Winona State Teachers College. He served as a science teacher in various high schools during the next few years. And in 1942, completed a professional course in meteorology at the University of Chicago. Because of the then extensive wartime meteorology training program, Mr. Sumi was retained as a staff member by the University of Chicago to participate in the expanded laboratory program. In 1948, a laboratory of experimental meteorology was organized at the university conducting research and methods of probing the atmosphere. A large portion of this research was concerned with moisture measurements Sumi made as director in this laboratory. And then I go to an insert or excerpt from a paper by Barrett and another individual on measurement of water vapor. We particularly wish to call attention to the highly essential contributions of Renry Sumi, director of the laboratory from its inception in 43 until July 48, who initiated the program of research in dew point hydrometry and devoted a large portion of his time and effort to personal participation in the work. Another thing he did there was a sonic anemometer uh, to measure turbulence and temperature. And you can go and you can find a paper here by Baird and Sumi uh, that's uh, published in 1948 in the Journal of Meteorology. And uh, this is the first time there were any measurements really made of atmospheric turbulence by sonic anemometers, at least as far as I know. If you go to the web and look up sonic anemometers, Wikipedia says that the first measurements made this way were in 1970. No record of Sumi's work in this particular area. And it's kind of interesting that way, you know, he did sonic anemometers, he did water vapor measurements, he did radiation experiments, and he served as the director of this laboratory at a very prestigious university University of Chicago, which was the first and foremost university in meteorology at that time. Uh, pardon to MIT maybe in UCLA, but I think Chicago was recognized as the top one at that time. I, I want to add in that uh, this little, that the sat, your satellite that you put up for Sumi was using my, well, it wasn't mine, but it was what I had saved as a model of this little gadget uh, that would uh, uh, code the data onto a tape and tick along at five uh, thousandths of an inch every second or so. And that was my one that I was going to keep out so we could have one. And he asked for it and I had to give it to him. Uh, well, it was a cute gadget. It really worked. By the time we uh, got around to the next satellite and, of course, People wanted his sensor so badly. We modified the bigger tape recorder oh, yeah. so that we didn't have to fly yours anymore. Yeah. We put the data on the regular, same one that held the pictures. Yeah. Yeah. And it made it, the satellite simpler. But I liked your little gadget. That was cute. Well, I'm not the one that designed it. That was, that was Bob Parent, wasn't it? No, no. Uh, Parent uh, 
No, I don't think Farron ever looked at it, uh, even. <clears throat> no, uh, part of the design came from a, a guy at... Uh, at Iowa. Iowa. Van uh, Allen. I think he came from, I heard. Well, it was his student. A student of Van Allen. Uh, yeah. Ah, is that right? Was it George Ludwig, perhaps? I don't know. No, I don't, rem I don't remember his name. <laughs> I just know he was, he was teed, teed off right? because they, they, the wrong name was used for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so me, so me told Later. Him. <laughs> he was so so uh, Van Allen also had experiments on the Explorer right. Sorry, on yeah. Explorer yeah. 7, and there was a lot of sharing among the groups. Which reminds me of another Sumi story real quick. He had several job offers when he graduated from the University of Chicago. And one was here at Wisconsin, and another was at the University of Iowa. So I asked him, how'd you decide? He said, oh, they were both good offers. But I went to Iowa and I found out that most of the faculty there took their vacations in Wisconsin. So I came to Wisconsin. <laughs> That's why I came to Wisconsin. Well, he knew, he knew uh, Bryson, too. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. There was. Well, in addition to being a great tinkerer and mechanical inventor, he was also a, a great person to uh, talk science with anybody who came to his mind. And, and who could meet on the street. Uh, one of the things I admired most about Sumi was his ability to meet and size up a person in five or ten seconds and talk science to that person at that person's level. Uh, and uh, I don't know, Bill, you spent a lot of time with him uh, in collaboration with scientists around the globe and around the world and getting them all cooperating. How did he do that? Well, I think uh, Sumi's success in, in rallying the world uh, science community behind his projects was really related to his personality, uh, as well as his wisdom, of course. But uh, he had the gift of, uh, of, uh, of attracting people and, and getting them enthusiastic about his own ideas. Uh, uh, his enthusiasm was, was truly infectious, and uh, people would see how much fun he was having. And uh, so they would have fun as well when uh, just listening to the man. And as you mentioned, um, he was he was uh, had the gift of, of making even complex ideas very simple by using simple everyday analogies. In fact, his uh, I remember his version of the Kiss principle was uh, "Keep it simple, sue me." <laughs> and uh, and it was his one-liners like this, which uh, not only made his discussions with, with uh, his uh, colleagues and so on, amusing, but uh, they all, always conveyed a very important message. And uh, Sumi, um, you know, he was always quick, too, to uh, congratulate uh, his colleagues or people who worked for him, his students, or, or even some of his competitors uh, on their successes, even when they beat them to the punch, beat him, himself to the, to the punch. One I remember, uh, which uh, was Pierre Morel, who beat him to the punch in getting the first water vapor channel on a geostationary satellite mm -hmm. on the Mediosat. And he immediately uh, uh, congratulated uh, Pierre for that, that accomplishment. The other thing about Vern Sumi is that it was obvious when you uh, talked to him and saw how he behaved with other people that he, he genuinely cared about the person, uh, regardless of his uh, professional level. It didn't matter whether he was an administrator or a student or what have you. And I think one example of that was uh, how he would entice people to quit smoking. And he did this with the president of the World Meteorological Organization as well as a, a colleague of mine in those days at, at NESDAS. And uh, he would do this by writing them a check and telling them they could cash that check after the first year of them not smoking. And uh, I think most of the time it worked. People stopped smoking. Nobody ever cashed a check. They would just frame it and put it on the wall as a demonstration of a person, a very important person, a great person who cared for them. Yeah. I've seen several of those frame checks. <laughs> I'm likewise never known of one that got no. cashed. And talking about Sumi, uh, 
bringing things down to your level. I was in my office one day, deeply involved in the administrative crisis of the day, and Sumi burst in and babbled at me about some great idea. And uh, I was only half paying attention, and I said, I'm sorry I didn't follow that. You're going to have to back up and start over. He looked at me, and he went to the blackboard and picked up the chalk and wrote F equal MA. He says, there, Bob, is that far enough back? <laughs> 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 Which was his measure of my scientific competence. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Pardon? He got your attention. <laughs> yeah, he did get my attention. <laughs> he got 100% of it anyway. <laughs> In addition to all we've talked about, uh, planetary-wise and even on the ground, uh, Werner was pretty much involved with the exploration of other planets and other planetary atmospheres. Uh, in addition to the net flux radiometer, uh, he did several other things, working primarily with you, Larry. Could you talk a bit about his uh, work with other planets and planetary soundings and things like that? Sure. The, uh, I guess the first one to talk about is the Pioneer Venus Netflex radiometer one, because that's the one I'm, I uh, first got involved with at a, at a fairly early stage in uh, my working in space science. The, the original idea he had in response to this NASA opportunity, NASA was going to send a, a series of probes to the planet Venus, and there was an opportunity to propose instrumentation for this mission, and Sumi wanted to uh, basically take over the entire probe. He, he proposed an uh, instrument to measure the net flux in the atmosphere. He proposed another uh, instrument to uh, do radar altimetry, following up on what had been developed for the Twirly uh, mission. And uh, he also wanted to propose the stable oscillator, which would be used to track the motion of the probe during descent from which the winds in the atmosphere would be determined. And so there's a big effort to put, a, put together all these proposals, and there was probably another one to do the temperature structure too, although I, I don't recall uh, seeing that in the package I was looking at the other day. But anyway, uh, the only uh, of these multiple proposals that actually passed through the first level of review was a net flux radiometer proposal. Now, why would you want to measure net flux in the atmosphere? Well, it turns out that uh, the net flux is the difference between upwelling and downwelling radiation fluxes, and if you measure it at the top and bottom of a layer, the difference gives you how much radiative energy is being emitted by the layer, which would cool it, or how much is being absorbed by the layer, which would heat it, and heating and cooling drive atmospheric motion. So this is basically the power, the, the heat engine that powers atmospheric motion, so it's a pretty important measurement. And his approach to doing this was to try to make it as pure and clean as possible. Unlike the uh, Venera probe that actually did measure radiation energy in the atmosphere of Venus earlier, uh, but poorly, this instrument would have a perfectly flat spectral response. It would, it would uh, respond the same at every wavelength, so it could integrate the, the flux without any knowledge of the atmosphere itself. It would also have a perfect angular response. It would have uh, the same response as a flat plate, uh, a perfectly absorbing flat plate, and that all angles would be treated like that, and that ends up being like a cosine response, a cosine of the angle of incidence. And so that was the basic approach to make this perfect uh, radiometer. And of course, reality intruded into this picture as we got further and further into the mission. And we, we had to deal with the uh, problems of Venus, which uh, the fir foremost of which was the high temperature at the surface of Venus, which is about 735 degree Kelvin, which is a rather substantial temperature to deal with, and 90 bars of atmospheric pressure, and CO2 being the atmosphere. Sulfuric acid clouds were another fine point that uh, had to be dealt with. And the 200 Gs of deceleration as we entered the atmosphere so in making a perfect instrument in that set environment was, to work in that environment was, was sort of difficult. And we had two approaches. One was to have a, a detector inside the probe pressure vessel, which was protected from this environment, looking through a window at a mirror that would be flipped up and down and look at the upward and downward hemispheres. And it turned out 
that was uh, very difficult for us to achieve with our limited mathematical and machining ability to uh, take that view and transform it into a perfect hemispherical view. The other option was to have an external sensor that was a flux plate, a plate uh, that would absorb this flux and develop a temperature gradient that was proportional to that flux, which would be measured by a thermal pile. That is the way we ended up going with the external sensor, and we actually managed to get it to operate inside a pressure vessel at the Venus surface temperature at that pressure with CO2, and uh, got it to mechanically flip and make measurements that were accurate. And the angular response was remarkably close to the perfection we were after. And we had diamond windows to uh, make sure it had transmitted all wavelengths, almost all wavelengths, uh, efficiently. Um, and so that, that's the way we ended up going. And there were, there were a number of problems that kind of uh, highlight the difficulties uh, of, of both working an instrument program and also working with, with Sumi at times. Um, he had one of, one of the stories that I could have related earlier was one that is really quite remarkable in, in <laughs> the physical demonstration. We had uh, this flipping sensor with a coil of wire that would wind and unwind as the sensor flipped, and it would carry the signals back into the probe. Uh, these were parallel strands that would slip and slide past each other easily, so it was easy to flex the coil. But in a life test, we discovered uh, wires broke during a life test, which is really quite a surprise. And after inspecting the details, we discovered that these nice parallel wires were twisted together. That was not on the design, so it was quite a surprise. And it turned out that one of the technicians had independently thought it would be stronger if these wires are twisted together. But stronger also meant harder, to, more resistance to uh, flexing. And, and, uh, and Sumi, when, when he was told about this, he said, aha, it, it's, uh, it's the extra stress of the wires bending against each other. And he demonstrated this by ripping a phone book in half. <laughs> and and he, he did it by creasing the phone book and then, use it, and then bending it so that the pages would be torn one at a time as, as he bent against that crease. That crease was act, acting like a fulcrum. And he would actually rip the phone book in half. It was quite an amazing demonstration. I mean, the idea was, was really good. Hard to execute, though. Not everybody can instantly rip a phone book in half. He must have practiced that, that quite a bit. But one of the more remarkable uh, things that he did was when we had a review, we had the sensor design all pretty much set to go. And there was this final design review uh, that would allow us to go forward and actually build the flight instruments. And, and the and NASA team came to Space Science, and uh, they looked at all our results. And, and at one point in the discussion, they expressed a great deal of skepticism about the strength of what looked like this delicate little sensor, which I have, uh, somebody has a, a sample of, this, this delicate little sensor surviving this 200G deceleration. And Sumi, and, and he was great for bold strokes, I must say, and, and simple, bold statements. And he, he grabbed the sensor head and stood up and flung it against the wall as hard as he could. And the sensor uh, was picked up off the floor, and it looked perfectly fine. And he said, uh, now do you think it will survive? <laughs> but he was a risk taker. <laughs> he was a risk taker. And... Uh, no, no amount of planning will replace dumb luck because after the meeting was over and the review team left and went back to wherever they came from, I took the sensor out in the hall and I personally threw it against the wall myself <laughs> and the windows broke. <laughs> and it, it, in a way it didn't really matter because we ended up using diamond windows on all of the probes instead of one with quartz and the diamond wouldn't have broken anyway. But he was taking a risk when he did that right. because it could have turned out the other have, way. Yeah. Larry, tell about the difficulty of finding those diamonds. Find, you, you had to find flat, thin diamonds about an inch in diameter or so? <clears throat> yeah. About, uh, They're hard to find. No, it was actually, I think it was closer to a centimeter a in centimeter. diameter and a millimeter thick. And uh, I think you go to De Beers. 
uh, to get the diamonds. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure it was all that difficult to get the diamonds, actually. I don't recall that being uh, all that much of an issue. We, we got a pair of them for each sensors, and I think it cost something like $5,000 for yeah. one pair of diamonds. Could they have made good earrings? <laughs> they look <laughs> terrible, <laughs> huh? <laughs> no. It, but, but the, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a little bit of a darker side to this sort of relationship, too. Because Sumi had a lot of frustration during this program, and not, not just with NASA teams, but with the way things were going in, in the development. And, and he, would, he would try to motivate uh, people and sometimes in rather, uh, seemed to me, inappropriate ways. And one, of, one concern he had was the, the uh, instrument electronics box uh, was going to weigh too much. And, and uh, he wanted that weight to get down below a, a certain amount. And one method of, of uh, achieving that was, was to offer uh, the engineer responsible a certain amount of money for every chip that he could reduce from the electronics design. <laughs> and I don't think he ever paid off on that, however. <laughs> and the other was uh, he once threatened to throw the engineer off the top of the building if he didn't <laughs> get the weight down. And I, I'm not sure whether, we, whether those motivations, uh, which of those was most important. And then the third time he was frustrated, he threatened to cancel the whole program and send the money back to NASA, which is a strong motivator to all of us on soft money. Well, he, he was still, you know, funded as a professor. So I, I didn't, we didn't all, all appreciate all of these motivations as, as much as, point. yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm going to leapfrog here just a bit. Uh, I think I'm going to go over to Bill Smith and uh, ask him to talk a little bit about the Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellite Studies, SIMS as it became known. Uh, another great example which you provided a couple of earlier of SUMI building bridges to, to colleagues and government agencies and everybody else. So can you tell a little bit about the uh, SUMI well, desire to create SIMS as a home for the feds? And other yeah, people? actually, um it all started, I guess, uh, when I was, uh, after I got my Ph.D., after that defense. Uh, Sumi told me, he said, uh, he said uh, you should go off to Washington and get some experience and come back in a year. He says, after you get that experience. So I went to Washington. Of course, I ended up being there uh, over 11 years because I got caught up in the space program there and, and worked for NOAA during that time. And then uh, we were both working on a common project, which was the GOES uh, Visitor Atmospheric Sounder that ended up being flown on the GOES-D satellite in 1980. And we decided we should combine forces uh, to build the ground system for that, for that institute, combine my group that I had in, in NESDIS, or NES, it was called at that time in Washington, with the group here at Wisconsin. So he, says, he asked me, he says, why don't you come on back? And so um, uh, he got Dave Johnson, who is a very close uh, uh, colleague and, and personal friend of his, to agree to, to have us come out there for a short time, a, a small group of government employees to work with uh, Space Science and Engineering Center and that ground system. So I came out with uh, uh, really the uh, six of my very best people and uh, to work on that system. And uh, Subi was quite impressed. He thought I was probably coming by myself or maybe with uh, one or two others, but he was impressed that the seven of us came. And uh, a short time thereafter, he said, he says, boy, he says, these government employees are taking quite a risk, you know, uprooting their families and bringing them out here and so on. And he says, uh, he says, it wouldn't be fair if they'd get called back to Washington after going through that expense and, and, uh, and, and uh, so on of, of coming out here. He says, we need to formalize this uh, collaboration. And that's, that's where the Cooperative Institute came from. And Sumi wasn't, uh, as I remember it, not trying to do any great things with the Institute except to provide uh, uh, stability, Safe personal stability, uh, for these uh, government employees that, that came out to uh, Wisconsin. That was first and foremost his uh, motivation for forming SIMS to formalize the government uh, relationship with the University of Wisconsin. That impressed me. 
uh, because, again, it was showing how he cared for these people, their personal well-being and, and their families, over and above the work that they came to do. And um, the other thing, of course, uh, Sumi was a bridge builder, always, uh, between people, between professors and students, uh, tried to bridge uh, uh, faculty <laughs> together and so on. And he saw this as an opportunity to uh, bridge uh, the University of Wisconsin's work with NOAA. And so to him, I'm sure Sims was also that. And eventually to be a bridge between NASA and NOAA. And uh, those were uh, in the backs of his mind. Now, people marveled at the fact that uh, I was able to, to bring seven government employees out of Washington to a university. It just wasn't done at that time. Uh, and, uh, but, but what made it happen was the fact that uh, Dave Johnson, who was the director of NESS, had probably the highest regard possible for an individual uh, for Vern Sumi. And um, uh, I remember one time, just, just to, as a little story uh, that went on in Washington, uh, showing his, his loyalty and uh, support of Vern Sumi. I remember uh, I was, when I was in, at NESS in Washington, I was at a budget meeting and we were deciding what universities would receive funding of their proposals. And uh, one of the reviewers, proposal reviewers then questioned Sumi's uh, proposal, the legitimacy of it, and recommended that this proposal not be funded. And Dave Johnson immediately, immediately uh, stated, <laughs> says, I don't care what that proposal says. Werner Sumi and his colleagues at the University of Wisconsin performed great work for the NOAA satellite mission. He says, they will be funded. End of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> So, in any event, uh, I, I, I remember I was writing most of those proposals, and that made the funding of them so much easier with that attitude on Dave's part. <laughs> he didn't care what the proposal said. He knew what, who was doing the, the critical work. Right. And, and Dave Johnson, he, I mean, I must say he, he is probably uh, the greatest uh, director thus far of uh, NOAA's satellite mission. So he, he was a very wise man. Uh, let me ask a question here, too, on that, because it had to do with uh, essentially getting the first uh, ATS experiment up. We know that Sumi went to Washington twice, one to be in the Weather Bureau as chief scientist, and the other was to go to NSF. Now, he had a special relation with Dave Johnson, and, of course, this is sort of built in following that, but he also had a special relationship, I think, with Bob White, who was heading everything. And uh, so I, can any of you tell me really, uh, I suspect that Bob White was one of the key individuals that simply said, we're going with an ATS experiment. I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. In 60, 65. Well, there was a NASA home renewal, right. but I mean. Right. I remember one story, uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but it was relayed to me about how uh, Sumi got home renewal. To, to support it. I guess, as someone said earlier, a lot of, they spent a lot of money trying to disprove his ideas. And uh, finally, I think uh, Professor Sumi was getting a, a bit frustrated, and so he stood up and he says, uh, he said, I just have one question. He says, are you for me or against me? And, of course, who would dare be against <laughs> Fern Sumi? Mm -hmm. Well, that and was that, used on more than one occasion going to yeah, NASA. Yeah. Uh, but there's also the aspect that uh, Bob White was a brother of William Allen White, and they were very close to the Kennedy administration. Of course, Kennedy had been shot by this particular time, but there still was this right. uh, impact there and that relationship. Sumi went to Washington when he had to, and I really feel that that was one of the reasons he went for yeah. that particular mm -hmm. year. Yeah, I would agree with that. Bob White was the uh, head of uh, ESSA or the forerunner Later of NOAA, NOAA right. at that time. And he, he, he was a good friend of Vern's. They were both in the National Academy of Engineering. Um, and they, uh, I can see Bob uh, supporting that project. And I think without the, the, the NOAA or the, uh, the weather support, um, NASA had many other proposals to fly experiments on what were then their 
uh, very early uh, geostationary satellite platforms. Some would spin, some tested other engineering stabilization ways. And um, I think uh, there were competing proposals, and I think that connection with Bob White and NOAA probably uh, helped uh, well, sway. Well, there's a bridge there between yeah, NASA and NOAA. That, and that mm -hmm. was part of the original SIMS, too, or shortly thereafter. Right. You, had a, Dave Jones. you had a joint agreement yeah. with NASA, NASA and NOAA. Well, he had, Tell me that. He had that built into that original that bridge between the right. agencies. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can remember some of those proposals and I shared with you all at lunch a time when um, Vern also had to have money to uh, test out his ideas. There were several different ideas. There were different types of cameras you could try to put on a geostationary satellite. And one day um, uh, Vern was, uh, projects were pretty much out of money and um, he needed some money to have Santa Barbara Research uh, Corporation um, do some uh, new engineering tests for him. And he went to his business manager, who said, who, Dave Sismoski at the time, who uh, uh, said, we really don't have any money and, and, and there's no money to send out for this. And Vern said, well, where is some money? And he said, well, over here in this project, there's money for the graduate students' salaries, but that's all committed. And Vern said, well, we're going to have to spend that money. And he did. He took a risk. Um, got his engineering studies done, got over a, a big hump, and all good things happened and other monies came in. The graduate students were paid and uh, we all lived happily ever after. <laughs> but I think uh, that's an example of uh, risk-taking, which you mentioned, faith in his own ideas, which he had. And you graduate students lived under higher stress for a short while. <laughs> we did honestly. We didn't know about it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> until until later, years later. Well, in addition to grad students, uh, I think Sumi was a big instigator and in cooperation among universities across the nation, and in fact, even internationally. And I'm leading into his early work in the Unidata program with Dick Greenfield and NSF to try to establish some sort of commonality and system where all universities could get data and, and research software uh, at nominal fees. I, I think, Don, you were one of the uh, main people involved in that startup, as I recall. Well, there was this emerging technology to present satellite data in a logical analysis with computers and been able to go back and forth and marry the two and you also had, of course, the development of uh, numerical weather prediction. We had the global weather experiment. And these things that all were happening are, are have happened. And we need to talk about Sumi's role in the global weather experiment and Figgy, too. But we'll move on to the unit data real quick. Like this capability was developing. Other schools were developing some capabilities along this line. But they didn't have the satellite input. Penn State, uh, Purdue, University of Washington. So. Tom can remember this. We had a workshop here sponsored by NSF in 90, 1990, 1977, I believe. Mm -hmm. And everybody came and marveled at, at this capability. Yeah. So there was a, a, a committee of, of four or five people appointed, the reports in, uh, with Werner Baum and Francis Brotherton. And I was on it and a few other people. And, and we took a preliminary look at this. Initially, the cost for Makaitis would be too expensive to actually put in every university. So the thrust of it was, if you're going to have this, you're going to have to collaborate. And of course, that turned out that uh, UCAR became the vehicle for that uh, formation of an activity called Unidata, so that all the schools could get access to this sort of information. There was another aspect to this, too, that uh, prior to that time, uh, the Weather Bureau uh, had been using teletype links and everybody in the schools could go to the local communications head of the various cities and, and get access to the teletype circuit of information that was provided. Uh, they actually went to a new system called AFOS, and that was going to do away with this. So universities were going to lose their, this access. And actually, uh, when that announcement was made, that's what led to these... Uh, ways in which we could come up with a means to provide this sort of information, which turned out to be unit data. It took about four or five years, but it happened. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the process of getting the information out, we knew we had, it, when Makaitis was going and 
And uh, Eric Smith was actually deriving really good winds from watching clouds move. We just knew that this had to get out to other people. And uh, one of the very first things we did, and you remember this one, Don, we uh, had three of these Ampex uh, hard disks. They were about this big around. They had been developed so that uh, video uh, programs of football games could go playbacks. The first ones could, f could contain only one television frame and not even the retrace, just the first trace. And so they were very limited. But we had finally managed, and they had very limited life. It was very primitive. But we finally had accumulated enough money to get three of these things so that with the computer, we could actually get three images in sequence and show the clouds move. We said, man, that's so good. We've got to do something with this. So we talked to WHA Television down here at the university. And we ran a cable, a, a coax cable, down through the old heating tunnels all the way across campus. And boy, those are hot in there. That was awful. We got that cable all the way over to Vilas Hall and into their studio. And for six months, WHA was the only television station in the world that was showing television pictures of the clouds moving and the earth stood relatively still. JT was still working on making the earth stand still. So once in a while it moved, but mostly it stood still. And uh, that went on until finally it got to be on national things and WHA didn't want to show it anymore because they were showing it on commercial television. So, but I think that's a feather in the cap of public television, uh, the local university station. May I add to that? <clears throat> we were the only place where that happened, WHA. Right. But you see, Frank Secrest then decided he wanted to go to Antarctica, and that's what brought the immediate end to that. Yeah. And we tried to get somebody to replace him, oh, yeah. maybe Terry Kelly, but he went out to Channel 27. Now, what you have happening from that is the development of what Terry Kelly brought to Channel 27, nationwide AccuWeather, uh, and Joel Meyer, who heads AccuWeather in Penn State, and also then the Weather Channel in, in uh, Atlanta. All yeah. these things grew out of that, well, basically, if you want to Terry Kelly about. was a graduate student, and we had a program called Innovative Video Applications in Meteorology. We were trying to develop the concepts and the software for putting a weather caster in front of a chroma screen and letting him do a good weather cast. Well, we didn't have the software. We couldn't really do it, but we made, we simulated it with a little movie film, and we needed to have a weather caster, somebody to stand in front of the camera. So we actually uh, auditioned three or four graduate students, and Terry was by far the best. So he got the job, and he did a terrific job. That film, we took it down to the American Meteorological Society's special session for weathercasters that year, and showed it, and boy, it was the hit of the house, I'll tell you. It, it, the weathercasters all went crazy over it, because that was the best presentation that anybody had ever seen of a weather, cast, or weather program. So that's the only time I think SSAC ever actually made a profit on a product. We sold 200 of those little VCR tapes to weather stations all over the country at $20 a piece, and they only cost us about six bucks each one. So we actually made a profit. Yeah, I think uh, Tom Whitaker deserves a lot of credit, too, for bringing other meteorological data and analyses and, and oh, things yeah. that, that went into Mekitis that really made it the, uh, the, the meteorological tool that it's been for the whole world. Yeah. Yep. Well, can I mention something there? Tom Whitaker was a programmer for me doing meteorological things. And when this came along, of course, he got nationally attracted to that and did that on the side. And then, of course, uh, yeah. sort of transitioned, soon we hired him. And mm -hmm. that was 
all well and good. Because yeah, and I've heard for five years about how we stole Tom Whitaker from Don Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that well. <laughs> well, that was the only thing I had to get at Bob Fox with. <laughs> I want to follow up on your comment about the global weather uh, thing that I don't want to gloss over that. Did you want to go further with that? I sure do. Okay. Go. Well, you had, uh, after the IGY, the emergence of what's going to be our next worldwide thing to work on. And that turned out to be the global weather experiment. Uh, it started really in the academy. Uh, I think Sarah Pedersen had aspects to do with that originally. But then, of course, they formed a planning uh, activity to uh, go and WMO and the other countries and form this umbrella called the Global Weather Experiment to carry out now this uh, observations of meteorology variables globally by satellites, by ships, by any means whatsoever. And then that data was to be uh, simulated into the global weather prediction models, which were coming on board at that particular time. So you had computers coming in and revolutionizing meteorology. You had the satellites coming in and providing this dimension to give you global weather information. And then, of course, uh, one of the key things was that to get five geosynchronous satellites around the globe so that you could get a complete coverage. You couldn't see the poles, but you could see 70 to 80 percent of it. And uh, the uh, U.S had two. Uh, the uh, Japanese, I believe, had one, and, and then also uh, the uh, uh, other country that committed one was the Soviet Union, um, and Europe had one. So there was a missing link here, and they were going to have this missing geosynchronous satellite over India, and lo and behold, of course, uh, there was a question. There's a spare one that NOAA has up there, can it be moved over? There were other scientists says we don't need it. Sumi insisted you do need it, and it got moved over there, and without that, it would have been a real disappointment. The other people on that committee, of course, that were, I know three of them, Charney, Tom Malone, and Sumi, and I'm, I don't know if it's Pierre Mayall, but there's a fourth person that sat in this uh, four person that played such a key role in, in uh, overall this umbrella. It possibly been somebody from the Soviet Union or, or Europe. But uh, these people uh, then, uh, under the global weather experiment, you had what was called FIGI, which is the first uh, uh, GARP, global. GARP global experiment. There was ALPEX, which was for the European community. There was MONEX, which was for monsoons over India. And I think that was it, but uh, there may have been others. But that was probably the most successful things that we did as a meteorological community uh, in that two three to, in that decade, so to speak. That eventually got changed into a, the um, uh, emphasis on doing uh, Earth system science. Mm -hmm. And there was a big discussion here at Sumi's retirement on that. Uh, Sumi and the meteorologists wanted to have a second figgy uh, going after the water planet and water. And of course, uh, the NASA people came out here and says, no, we got to make this into all earth science disciplines, and that's what became earth system science uh, under the uh, NASA umbrella primarily, as well as uh, the worldwide effort in this area. So Sumi uh, was right up there at the top in all of these, and because of his background in thought of the science, but also the instrumentation, he was a, he, well, I don't say he was a dominating figure, but he was one of the dominating figures. Yes, I remember that, Don. You know, um, when Explorer 7 began to get Earth observations, quasi-globally, here and there, but it was enough to begin to get a picture, and then Tyros, and then the Air Force satellite experiments and others, um, and the Nimbus program that someone mentioned earlier did come on, and Bill was involved in that, and I was, and a lot of Sumi's people. Um, this whole idea of uh, global observations uh, in addition to the geostationary, SUMI had vision was to have both the polar orbiting satellites and the f six or five geostationary. And as we talked about earlier, his ability to communicate that to Russian academicians, to old line German uh, meteorologists, to uh, people in developing countries uh, uh, in Japan and other areas. Um, I mean, he, he, he was a great... Uh, 
wanted to bring people together on this. And so yeah, I think no he, doubt he led the way. You could, the, yeah, in many ways. Well, satellite would, system. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so. And the whole yeah. World Meteorological Organization was ready for that now. And the World Weather Watch um, continued after 1979, after Figgy. And that World Weather Watch, uh, you know, continues to be augmented up to today. So the legacy back from Explorer 7 right here at Wisconsin and, and with their colleagues really goes, uh, you know, up into this whole global observing systems and then you said Earth system science, well, which without, is broader. Well, without the geosynchronous satellite, we could never have had a global system yeah. to right. get observations. Right. Yeah. I think that's but, probably true. No, it's... The, uh, Polar orbiting satellite helps a lot, but it simply doesn't provide the coverage that the geosynchronous orbit satellite does. It provides more detail. Yeah, he was many years um, ahead of his time. Today we are talking about constellations of satellites, right? and there are some up there now, as you know, GPS and, right. and uh, others. And indeed, they begin to, to provide that type of coverage if they look at Earth. But uh, he was uh, decades ahead of his time with that concept, with the geos. But can't we back up even well beyond all this? Wasn't he a, a force in the IGY, International Geophysical Year, planning and getting that started and bringing that data collection uh, into fruition? As, as I remember stories I used to hear, that of course was in the 50s and uh, I want to say slightly before my time, but you guys probably remember it well. I don't think he was the force that led to the origin of it, because there is a PBS show on this, uh, actually, of how in uh, coming up with and, and having satellites here in this country relative to the Russians, that uh, they were going to use the IGY so that you could put up scientific experiments, satellites going all over. We went into this problem, the airspace above each country was considered sacred. When the Russians put up Sputnik, then that broke that. That did. did yeah. it. So yeah. then we put up our satellites, and we weren't running into this problem. So the Eisenhower, you know, they say in the military and that particular people who were doing it at that particular time have run up to this, that, you know, if we put a satellite up now going over the Russia, we ha we're in danger here now um, because that was considered sacred territory. So... Uh, but, you know, that IGY in Antarctica and that was to be a means by which we could all come together as countries. Yes. Now, he got involved in, in eventually in doing the science of it. I think but he was one of the uh, investigators, whereas people like Harry Wexler and others, perhaps slightly before Vern, uh, in the United oh, yeah. States, were more the U.S. leaders for the, um, for the okay. IGY. Right. He was one of the young investigators at that point. How old, his, how old was his, his contribution was uh, with the Vanguard missile? Yeah. missile. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but that wasn't as part of the IGY plan directly. Yeah. Other than it was to be a satellite system that could give us global information. Yeah. yeah. But the funding, I think, by NSF was based on the IGY, wasn't it? The yes. Support? That's probably yes. true. Right. But the trouble was that right. mm -hmm. they had the wrong company making that satellite. <clears throat> Or that uh, rocket. Mm. Boy, they were sloppy. It <laughs> <They> went <laughs> <Yeah>. roop, Obviously. <laughs> right in the ocean. <laughs> there was the other problem here. Do you have various countries taking territory, yeah. yes. a part of the Antarctica? Mm -hmm. right. so, oh, right. yeah. So it was a skillfully designed. Um, the State Department was involved in this uh, scientific experiment. You know, part of this... Uh, whole globalization business was who's going to store the data that are collected by everybody and how are you going to make them available generally? There were data centers and the World Meteorological Organization had already started some work toward world data centers. But SUMI somehow got me appointed as the chairman of the data panel for the Geophysics Research Board. And for 15 years, my job <laughs> was to oversee all of the data centers in the United States and coordinate with the World Meteorological Organization for the world data centers and keep trying to fight for money for those data centers. And then report back to Sumi when I got into trouble and say, hey, apply a little pressure because they aren't going to come through with the money for the uh, data center that was for some 
particular kind of data like uh, the petroleum research and deep earth soundings, this sort of thing. They were all going to be destroyed. So Sumi would get a hold of somebody that he knew in Washington and pretty soon you knew the money came through. So, yeah, that worked out very well. Even five years after I left SSEC, I was still chairing that, still feeding back to Sumi and getting the money for that, those data centers. I don't know who's doing it now, but somebody has to because data centers tend to be underfunded. Well, we've been running a data center for the polar uh, places for now for it's almost 29 it was 29 years just about yeah and we give it out to anybody that wants it <laughs> and we got just about everything you want on the poles and of course there is this problem that you can't get complete coverage with these uh, uh, <coughs> satellites that are, are running around the earth but we come pretty close yeah very cool. Larry, I think we sort of skipped over the whole Visser atmospheric sounder in this process, too, if we can diverge a little from some of this uh, global political discussions and go back to a little uh, practical science discussion. Could you lead us there? Yeah, this is, the, the VAS program was sort of where I started to learn by doing since I, I came to uh, space science with a PhD in theoretical physics and a complete ignorance of meteorology and atmospheric science. It was uh, quite an education working with SUMI. Um, at any rate, the, the VAS program